All right. Um, well, welcome everyone to the DHSS Reorganization uh, Compliance National Best Practices subgroup uh, meeting. Uh, wanted to, I'm Christina Bryan. I'm a co chair of the subgroup. Uh, my role is actually director of communications and policy for the Delaware Healthcare Association. I'll let my co chair, John Whitelaw, introduce himself. Um, my name is John Whitelaw. I am uh, Christina's co chair. <laughs> <laughs> She's my boss. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, I'm uh, the advocacy director at Community Legal Aid in um, Wilmington. All right. And uh, why don't we go ahead and let the other um, participants who are joining us today, and we've got another subgroup member with us, Don Alexander. Don, if you want to introduce yourself. Hi, I'm Don Alexander. I work for Colonial School District. Thank you. Um, and then Steve Constantino, who is our representative from uh, the Secretary's Office from the Department of Health and Social Services. Thank you. Um, I'm Stephen Cosentino. I'm Director of Healthcare Reform for the Secretary. Thank you for joining. And then uh, Hillary, do you want to say hi? Yes, hi. I'm Hillary Patterson, not a, a member of the committee, but um, used to work with John Whitelaw at Community Legal Aid in Wilmington and now am a lawyer at Hunt and Andrews Kirk. Thank you. And then our very helpful staff person uh, for the subgroup and the overall um, DHSS re reorganization effort, uh, Alexa. Hi, everyone. I am Senator Nicole Poor's legislative assistant, and I will be assisting with the subgroup um, as well as Taylor as we transition. And I just wanted to notify to everyone that we have not yet reached a quorum. Thank you, Alexa. And then um, I do see Taylor has joined us. I don't know if Taylor, you want to say hello? Introduce yourself. Hi, I'm Taylor Hawk. I used to staff this committee. Um, and I'm just here in case Alexa needs anything or if any of you need anything. Thank you, Taylor. Um, and as Alexa mentioned, we don't have a quorum, so we can't do any official business here um, today, but we can certainly um, run through our agenda and discuss uh, kind of our recommendations as we discuss them during our last meeting and talk about anything that possibly needs to be added. That's really the purpose of this meeting um, today, because uh, as we've discussed at the full committee meetings, um, the timeline has changed a bit because of COVID in terms of when the recommendations are due to the General Assembly for the whole DHSS reorganization effort. Um, so in March, uh, the subgroups are supposed to refine their recommendations. In April, um, the full committee is supposed to, I believe the full committee is um, the way I wrote this down, hopefully that's correct, is supposed to vote and accept final recommendations from the subgroups. And then in May, there will be a draft final report with the approved recommendations that is developed. So that is the timeline we're working on. Obviously we're in March, so our goal here is to um, refine our recommendations and then um, just want to run through our agenda, but before I do so, I don't know if John, if you have any other comments you want to make before we get started. No, we're good. All right, cool. Um, okay, so review on the agenda and approval of the meeting minutes from uh, February. We actually just discussed with Alexa a minute ago. Um, our last meeting was actually March 2nd, and not February 10th. Um, so you have the February minutes, which what we believe were already approved during the March meeting. Um, and in March, if I recall correctly, I know we heard a presentation from, from Don Alexander, one of our sub, subgroup members. We also reviewed um, some survey results that Don had actually put together um, for us. And then we discussed kind of our initial recommendations, which we then, then presented to the full subcommittee at that uh, March meeting as well. Um, but we will be just, we'll discuss the meeting minutes at, at our next meeting in, uh, in greater detail and be able to vote on those. Uh, the next agenda item will be to recap the last full reorganization committee meeting. Um, and then after that, review and discuss the subcommittee's draft recommendations from 2020, and then review new information since recommend recommendations were developed. And then finally, um, next steps and action items and public comments. So with that, um, let's move on to recap of last full reorganization committee meeting. Um, I basically just did that in terms of the timeline. Uh, we all kind of updated where each subcommittee was. We met in December of 2020 um, at the full committee and um, discussed the, the timeline again, you know, trying to finalize, uh, refine recommendations now in March. And then uh, I also wanted to share uh, an update on the full committee discussion from our last 
uh, pool committee meeting in March 2020, which is when we actually presented the, the um, recommendations to the rest of the pool committee, just to give you guys kind of a, some feedback of the responses that, that we got or questions that we got when we presented them. Um, so just a couple of things, and I'm just reading from the minutes from that pool committee meeting. Um, there were some questions around our recommendation for a needs assessment. Um, some folks were looking for additional information. Dr. Farley actually asked if the needs assessment would be an organizational needs assessment or an assessment of DHSS consumer needs. I offered that I thought because of the DHSS um, reorganization committee's uh, you know, goals uh, that it would actually be consumer focused. And I talked to John afterwards and he agreed that it would be a needs assessment would need to be uh, focused on DHSS consumers. And I know there's a consumer um, subgroup that's actually working on, you know, trying to develop some of those, uh, identify some of those needs. And, and we thought if they were able to identify some needs, then we can kind of look to national best practices to support some of those needs. So um, I'm not sure how their progress is, and I don't know if Alexa or Taylor is aware of, of that subgroup, how they're doing, if they've, if they've actually developed kind of their um, identifying the needs that are out there that we can kind of work from, or if that's just something that we'll, we'll address down the line. The only other comment I wanted to make on the <coughs> needs assessment was, um, at the time we were doing this, you know, a year, year and a half ago, DHSS, uh, was in the process of finalizing a, a needs assessment that they had conducted, but it was an in, it was an internal and staff needs assessment in the sense that it was not outwardly facing. It was not a needs assessment that that was directed towards the needs of the of the recipients uh, uh, by design. I don't. It's not a criticism of the study itself, but the, the but they had undertaken a study. Um, uh, that was not an, a needs assessment of what consumers needed. And then I think part of what had motivated us was we had a very helpful presentation um, that was, um, sponsored is not the right word, but that, that Dawn brought, uh, I forget the person that Dawn had come in to talk to us. She was someone who either was working for the Department of Ed or, or who had contract with the Department of Ed. I just can't remember. The, I see, but they had done a pretty comprehensive needs assessment and it had been consumer facing. Um, and I thought and I and my recollection is that we thought that having a consumer focused needs assessment was critical to evaluating what's working and what's not working. And that sort of, I think, is the genesis of our needs assessment recommendation. Does that sound about right, everyone? Yes, yep, agree, John. Um, so that was kind of the, the feedback that we got at the um, meeting where we presented our initial recommendations. And that's probably a good segue to kind of go back and, and review what those uh, recommendations were. So I'm gonna share my screen and then um, maybe ask John to walk us through those uh, so you don't hear me talk the whole time. Hang on one second. Let me share. Okay. So and I'm not gonna read every word on them because that doesn't make sense for folks. Um, oh, let me see. Is it? I have mine up, so I have to check. Are you sure? I am my... having some difficulty sharing. I, it's just, I, I'm probably not set up or something properly. So let's check and see who's on. Does everyone have them that's on? Alexa, could you just make uh, Christina a co-host? That way she can share her screen. It might be a user error, Taylor, on my part. <laughs> um, I had to open system preferences and then I'm lost after that. So not it should be on the, um, the bottom, center bottom. Yeah, I see that. Um, but then it asked me like, do I wanna share my desktop or iPod? I'm just yes. saying desktop and then it says open system preferences. And then I get- um, And then I hate you. Some crazy options here. Oh wait, maybe this works. If not, I'm happy to share. Yeah, will you guys keep in mind? It's the last, um, the yeah. last attachment. The report. I. Yes. Thank you.
There we go. <laughs> Perfect, right? Um, I have mine up, so I will actually be looking at mine, um, but we'll go through it um, and we'll just talk about them. Uh, I'm not okay. going to sort of go through the executive summary. I'm going to go straight to the subgroup recommendations. Hang um, on a second, John. Hey, Alexa, sorry to interrupt. Um, I just got a text from Cheryl Hike. She's just looking for the Zoom info. Would you mind emailing her the um, panelist link again? Yes, I just had, um, I just sent an email to um, DTI to have them resend that. Great. Thank you so much. Uh, carry on. Yes, I will carry on. So I think um, one of the, and I'm going to do a summary of it, this, that, um, that explains what we saw as a problem and then what we thought the, 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 the potential solution was. Um, and, and it's going to be in relatively short, uh, sort of condensed form. Uh, I think one of the big issues that was identified was that there was um, some significant siloing of the different DHHS divisions where, um, and I'm exaggerating a little bit, where they acted like independent fiefdoms rather than sort of part of a comprehensive whole. Uh, and the problem with that was that there was, that, that there was a, that the secretary's office, meaning the, the component of DHHS that was sort of sits above all of the divisions was under-resourced and understaffed so that they didn't have the um, personnel and the ability to be able to coordinate as well as they would have liked between um, the different divisions. And so we thought that that was a, a significant sort of issue that needed to be addressed. Um, uh, and that was, um, you know, one C to be blunt. <laughs> Um, and it's also 1A. It's basically trying to put, um, uh, give the secret at the secretariat level, give the secretary, I don't exactly want to say greater control, but sort of a, more resources to oversee the divisions and to coordinate matters so that they would be acting as much in harmony as opposed to separately. And I think that we thought, I think we all thought this, that was a major issue. Um, uh, and then um, specifically with DMS, which is management services, uh, bringing them uh, because they had roles as it relates to serving the other divisions, not serving is not quite that, but working with the other divisions that they should be not thought of as a separate independent division, but should be under direct secretarial control. So I think that's one. Does that, does anyone have, um, Oh, and then similarly, just more specifically, that they didn't have, there was no centralized way to seek out grant opportunities. It was done, you know, bits and pieces of different people whenever they had time to do it. And I may be exaggerating a little bit, but not much. And that there wasn't a coordinated effort to have um, either control or sufficient resources dedicated to seeking out funding opportunities um, and that if there were greater um, centralization of that or coordination of that, if someone uh, was, um, if there was an entire, and I don't mean like a 600 you know, person office, but if there was someone for, who had ownership over that across divisions, that that would lead to a better coordination in that. Um, that's recommendation number one. Does anyone, um, and do we wanna do comments? one at a time or should we go through them all, Christina? What's your preference on that? Maybe one at a time. Um, and I, I actually, two things. One, I just saw that Cheryl Hikes joined us. So thank you so much, Cheryl, uh, for jumping on. To, to Hi, Cheryl. Time. Really appreciate that. Um, and then I, I was just curious, maybe Stephen, I don't know if you had um, any thoughts on this recommendation, uh, you know, from kind of DHSS's perspective. I know you probably can't comment on the whole thing or not all of it, but, um, you know, um, but I, um, I, I think uh, I think John did a, a, a very good job in summarizing some of the challenges and the barriers of having a, a very large um, uh, department uh, with 11 divisions. Um, uh, and I think all I can say is as we went through this process and I think the February meeting in talking about best practices with other states, um, uh, I think we saw where 
having a, um, a, a well-resourced secretary's office with the ability to kind of have that kind of um, lateral or horizontal integration across these issues is extremely important. Um, the issue with grants that he mentioned, obviously, it's not even sometimes that we don't get the grants, but sometimes you apply for grants, um, and this is federally driven sometimes, so most of the time, um, that different divisions apply for that sometimes overlap and may and sometimes complement some uh, what the work you're doing and sometimes they don't complement the work you're doing so having that coordinated collaborative approach across divisions um in, um, in i don't know i mean i don't have the answer to that unless they're not doing it right well, it looks like sounds coming out see if you can could someone your put, headphones? someone needs to be muted i, I think yeah. you. your camera's uh, not on we can Cheryl. Can hear you but we can't see yeah you. but that's where your microphone is no, not, that hasn't been the case. Oh, um, you I don't have a microphone in your computer. I have had not had to have the camera on to have. Um, so, Carol, so um, Stephen, go ahead. I'm sorry. <laughs> so anyway, um, thank you, Alexa. <laughs> um, I think that's uh, an, an important component, and and you know it goes. It, it's not only grants. It's it's overall policy. It's fiscal. It's legal. It's code, um, and just having the the ability to cross, um, as I call, uh, cross navigate or cross fertilize across the divisions to make sure that we're really an agency of one um, and working together um, uh, is why I think these recommendations are coming forward. So uh, again, I think John did a, uh, an excellent job in uh, and, and capturing. Thank capturing. you, thank you, Steve. That's the, uh, at least I didn't get that one wrong yet. Um, on, as we're going through these, the other thing that I would ask if anyone on the, if it's been a year since we've done this, so there may have been changes since we did this. And if there are, we obviously need to know about them because if they've been done, we obviously need to take them off. Or if the world, you know, if the world has changed as it relates to the different recommendations, we definitely, we, you know, we should, we obviously got, uh, 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 want to be flexible about that. So when people are commenting, if something has significantly changed, um, and I'm thinking of Dawn in the education and early childhood governance, which is not an area that I'm particularly familiar with. If there has been a change in the underlying universe and world, we obviously need to know about that. Um, okay, recommendation number two um, was fairly narrow, but we had heard time and again uh, from the department that one of their frustrations is that um, there are requirements in the Delaware code that are outdated and don't seem to be particularly useful, um, yet they hamper um, ways in which the department can, can act. And so it seems, and, and in some ways, this would be potentially something that, that um, someone in the, in, in the revamped and beefed up commissioner's office would do is, you know, take a hard look at the Delaware code to come up with a, and look at provisions that just don't make any sense anymore um, and come up with a potential legislative package um, to fix those problems. Um, because again, I don't, I, I think what has happened and this is, is that the, uh, you know, they may have been identified in individual circumstances, but there hasn't been a, um, you know, no, uh, a, 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 a DHHS wide attempt to address these. Um, and we thought that, but we did hear it as, as a, as a non-trivial problem, as a significant problem that, that, that um, would be a good thing for the department to undertake. Yeah, John, and I, I would just add, um, it's next on our agenda, but I don't think we really need to spend a whole lot of time after this talking about it, but. Um, Secretary, now Secretary McGarrett did provide us after our last meeting, a one pager, just an example of some of the areas that, you know, should be kind of taken out of code and put more in the regulatory arena. Um, and I don't think we necessarily need to detail these in our recommendations, but it was just helpful for her to kind of show, you know, these are some exam examples of, of areas where um, what, what, they're what we're talking about here in terms of making it uh, a little bit easier and provide more flexibility. Um, for example, uh, number one that she had listed was um, health systems protection fees. 
um, which are in $16 code uh, 122. If they're in regulations, this would give DPH more flexibility. So fees can be a reasonable reflection of community demand. Uh, for example, the restaurant community is understandably dissatisfied with the long wait times for restaurant plan review and would be content with higher fees if, if it allows DPH to hire additional plan review staff. So um, just wanted to, to highlight that a little bit further. Uh, absolutely. And I think perhaps one of our, you know, we would probably want to put in here that the department should, they might need to develop a legislation. You know, this is obviously legislation, so they're going to have those. You know, there are separation of powers issues between having statutes and regulations. And I, I, you know, what the department, what we're recommending the department do is undertake this and develop a legislative strategy um, because it's not as simple as waving a magic wand and having it uh, be done. And I agree with you entirely that we should attach the list to the recommendation of uh, as examples of. Um, provisions that could that can be looked at. I don't think we we're not going to take a we don't need to go as far as to take a position that these should either go or stay, but we can put these as examples of provisions that we would want you know the department to sort of ex take a position on officially and then and then do whatever work was necessary um, to, to determine if they can make if legislative changes would be something that can be happened because I again um, that would be that one. Okay, number three, and I think this is incredibly important, and, um, uh, and we hear this from families um, time and time and time and time again, is, uh, and to clarify, this is for folks who are living at home, uh, who primarily uh, uh, functionally would qualify for uh, you know, a nursing home level of care, but are getting the care in their own homes, there are lots and lots, let me be blunt and short on this, because the providers, um, there's a great, let me, let me say it a little easier. There's a great deal of difficulty in maintaining and keeping a provider workforce um, to, to, to give the services that have been medically approved. And it's a combination of shortage of workers, low pay, and a variety of other factors um, uh, that make it very difficult for individual consumers and recipients who are medically eligible for, say, you know, 20 hours a week to actually get the 20 hours a week. And it's particularly acute where it's, um, uh, or one of the areas where it's particularly acute is for nursing services. And so, and I don't think that there's any, I think everybody in the state talks about this. It's also not just a Delaware issue, but in terms of some of um, DHSS's most vulnerable consumers, this is a huge deal. And it's um, providing an opportunity, it's strengthening the workforce in the sense of making it uh, more attractive or less unattractive, depending on how we want to phrase it, to get folks to have a, a larger, more available work to provide these supports and services to keep people uh, home. And what happens if you don't get these services, which is not here, but I will, I think people will understand. So either one, it ends up uh, being unpaid labor of family members, which stretches them terribly, or worst case scenario, people end up in nursing homes who don't need to be there because they can't get the services they need in their own home. Not because they haven't been approved medically, but because there's not enough, there, there aren't enough people willing to provide the services. So this is a this is a big deal. I think it's also an expensive deal, um, uh, but I think that's sort of the sum of number three. Yeah, John, well said. Um, I was kind of hoping she would be here today because she's she's got direct experience in this. I know she's a caregiver for a family member. Um, and she's just listening sorry, to I'm the GAFC hearings where, uh, you know, DHSS presented the governor's recommended budget and then you hear public comments. I know there was a countless number of um, direct support professionals and other professionals um, that really stressed that, um, that more funding is needed for you know more higher reimbursement is needed, um, and that COVID placed a huge strain on on that workforce and, and the ability to take care of, of folks with with disabilities that are you know living at home and and to help them make make sure that they're able to um, you know to be active parts of the community and 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 everything that that we want them to be. So uh, this is definitely a critical one. I'll also add I know that the DHSS. Um, 
as directed by the JFC, has done a uh, commission an independent study to review reimbursement um, rates. And I don't know, Stephen, is, you're welcome to, to comment a little bit more on that. Um, I, I know I heard from the public during the JFC kind of hearings, they were saying it's, it's not happening quick enough. So um, I just want to put that out there too that um, I think this is, is a very important piece. Um, and I see Cheryl's hand, hand raised. Hey, Cheryl. Guys, I had a question about the comment. I completely agree that the resources are needed for home and community-based care. There's a, a real continuum for individuals, many of whom also um, you know, reside in long-term care with individuals with disabilities when, they, when their condition may deteriorate to the point that they are no longer able to live in that environment or they have to cycle in for a period of time. Or, you know, quite frankly, when their parents pass away, like places like Mary Campbell um, or exceptional care for children for the very young. Um, we're, we're blessed in Delaware to have those types of resources, those nonprofits in Delaware as options for families um, and for individuals. The, I think the issue is, um, thinking about how we define home and community-based care, give them the resources and the access to things that they needed. The uh, PPE, for example, the access to testing. When, when we looked at um, the, the prevalence of COVID during this last pandemic, um, even though there it wasn't available at the beginning to long -term, for long-term care, and, and of course we saw the results of that, the individuals with disabilities were just as, as and probably more so in many ways, um, because of the lack, the rate of community spread, just as vulnerable. And those settings, those home and, home and community-based settings, it being in the community where the community spread was, those individuals were just as vulnerable. And there's there's not the level of oversight um, for them or the ability to inspect. There's not there just isn't the people in DHSS to be able to do that as there is in in nursing homes and I think it's it would behoove the state to be looking at that from you know for the level of care for those individuals um, when they talk about increased wages that's always an important piece of it but they also need to find a way to provide the staff for the folks in the division of healthcare quality to give them the training and the access to to, to care and resources testing PPE for all those people in the Division of Healthcare Quality to come out and give them the guidance and assistance that they were able to offer the long-term care in the, in the more in the facility setting, because it was definitely needed. It was one of the things that didn't, didn't happen as systematically as it happened in the more traditional facility setting. And in addition to help for those providers, I think it would support the families and the, and the residents in a more meaningful way. No, I think those are important points. And much as it pains me to say this, um, this may be the first pandemic that we have had to deal with. Um, it may not be the last. Oh, it's um, definitely so not. I, so it, it's the first, <laughs> the first global one, but it's certainly not the first time that this that a. Uh, but the first, it's the you know, we, there may there there are important lessons to be learned here that we will need to do a, to. And the, the the points that you have made um, that we'll need to that we will probably need to uh, do again. I mean, I I, I so I, so I appreciate. Yeah, like looking at wages is the only thing that has to that has to change in that environment, and we support that because they are our partners, and and so is the home health care environment for residents that are, that come but, and go from our environment, come from the hospital, come back. It's all a circle here, and and I think everybody agrees, and I don't think there's any dispute amongst any of us that. Um, uh, to, to, to say that we want to people, keep people home as long as we can is not a knock on nursing homes or institutionalized care for those, for those folks who cannot be served at home. So I think there's, a, there's absolutely, as you said, a continuum there. And I think everyone shares in the goals here of both having a robust facility environment for folks who need to be in facilities and then a robust home environment to keep as many people out of facilities um, as is realistic. I also, okay. I also think it would be probably for those who 
think about nursing homes and and it's it's also I mean I've had I needed those for my mother a lot of people need them they don't like them until they need them and they are glad when they're there so I think when this pandemic's over it might be good for all of us to to take some even if they're remote uh, tours to see what's actually happening and to become more comfortable with what because I think people are uncomfortable with what they're not familiar with they're not the nursing homes that were around 20 years ago um, and I, I think it may be helpful for a lot more people to be uh, familiar with the actual environment. There are there are ones that could use some help, and there's some that are are you know. So I think it's the, uh, up to all of us who are trying to make improvements to try to get everybody up to that higher level, and that's probably Agreed. the same in the home and community based environment too. So, but thank you. Okay, um, the next one. And I'm definitely going to be looking directly at Miss Alexander here um, <laughs> shortly. Um, there was a great deal of concern raised, and it's similar to issue number one, although more complicated because it's not just two divisions, it's two departments. Uh, there was a, a great deal of concern on our committee and, and from external um, uh, organizations and groups that we consulted about the interplay between the Department of Ed and DHSS in serving the same vulnerable population that, that is fairly high needs. And so there were two specific recommendations um, that were made. One is moving idea part C from DHSS to the Department of Ed, um, which uh, to be effective 7-1-21. And I think we're gonna need an, a, a quick update on that because I suspect that this recommendation may be somewhat out of date. Um, and then, you know, the child care development block grant becoming with DOE becoming the lead agency effective 7-1-21. We just, I'm the, I, I will confess, I'm just not sure where we are on those. <laughs> Um, and if, if those recommendations may not need to be made anymore, if, if that world has changed, uh, and if it has changed, are there slightly more updated recommendations can be made? And I think maybe we can get a very a quick summary from Dawn about where we are in that and whether this needs to be tinkered with because it's no longer current or accurate. Thank you, John. There is legislation to be filed regarding moving IDEA Part C from DHSS to DOE. And the date of the move, of the recommended move, is um, in negotiation at this time. So legislation will be filed by, by Senator Sturgeon. We expect that to be filed in the next month or so. So it would be beneficial to have the support of the subcommittee and the larger group um, for that legislation. So that continues okay. to be a recommendation. Um, Great. The next, yes. Um, advocates have been working on that for about a year. So we've been busy during COVID. Um, and then the next is the Child Care Development Fund block grant. There is, advocates are continue to um, recommend this move. In other states, the Department of Education is the, uh, the lead agency. And then the health or DHSS would bill the Department of Education for the work that is the eligibility work. So families would still go to a social service person to apply for childcare eligibility, but that would be billed to the Department of Education. Um, so that's, we still need that support, that recommendation. And I don't know, um, I know some people who are on this meeting may wanna to speak to that or may want to wait to speak to that. But it sounds like we have not made ourselves obsolete yet on either one of these. And in fact, yeah. uh, the, the, a, a strong recommendation from both the subcommittee and then the full committee would be, and, I, and I'm going to use this word and I don't mean it in a, I mean it in a positive way, would be very useful politically to lend support to the legislative um, uh, goal of having this happen. So this is actually, in some ironic way, is very timely. And then the third one, um, or, or would be C, which I'll send to everyone, is we previously talked extensively about the different kinds of screenings for which children are eligible. And during COVID, many of us who are stakeholders had opportunities to review the EPSDT program. This is through Medicaid. Um, and children birth to 21 who are eligible for a slew of 
screening, screenings, as well as preventative measures, our compliance percentages in Delaware are very, very low. So these are services that are already covered by Medicaid, but they're not being, they're not being implemented. So I would recommend that, and, and it's my understanding that legislation will be coming forth about to support compliance and reporting. Um, so I can send that to everyone if that would be helpful. Okay, so I'm, I'm a little uncertain of what, and I actually know a fair amount about the Medicaid aspect of this. I'm a little uncertain as to what, how, uh, I mean, clearly the department, Delaware needs to comply with EPSDT, but saying that actually doesn't, you know, that's, you know, the law requires it. Is there a specific recommendation at specific the recommendation. institutional level about how to change Delaware's, uh, what you describe as Delaware's um, uh, lo low participation rate in that yes. is in terms of how it is being handled in, you know, is it, is it transferring it to a different agency, which parenthetically there's gonna be some yes. issues with, cause I think it has to be done through Medicaid. Um, the recommendations they're, they're are, the, go the ahead. Recommendations are ensuring that there are benchmarks. So other states have benchmarks for compliance, 80% compliance, 90% compliance, 75% compliance. The USDHHS recommends 80% compliance, yet in Delaware, we have no compliance benchmarks. Okay, so, so you're gonna send us something on that? Yes, yes. Okay, can, can, and, we'll, can and we can consider it by email or at the next meeting to add to, that would be, um, Yes, it's I don't know if we want to make it 4C or separate, but that's sort of a mechanical thing that we don't really need to sort out today. And I have a question, actually, Don. Who who's responsible for doing these screenings? I mean, is it something that is so it who is responsible? So, schools or okay, what? so it's birth to age twenty one. So DHSS has contracts with the MCOs. The MCOs have contracts with their participants. So pediatricians are the ones who are supposed to be following the American Academy of Pediatrics Bright Futures Schedule of Periodicity, which I can send to all of you. So DHSS has adopted the schedule of periodicity saying we will, our MCOs will follow this protocol, but the protocol is not being followed. So DHSS contracts with the MCOs, MCOs contract with the pediatricians, the pediatricians are not implementing these screening and preventative measures with fidelity. So on Medi if you look at the Medicaid numbers, uh, Medicaid.gov provides a great deal of information for each state's compliance levels. And when you look at the child quality data for Delaware, the compliance levels are lackluster. Okay. I, I just personally, just hear, not knowing too much about this issue, just would be interested in hearing um, just from the pediatricians as to why they're not, if they're, you know, if it's a cost issue, if it's a time issue, I just, just wondering, obviously screenings are needed, but. Well, I, you know, I, I know that we have um, a, um, a member of the public who will be speaking at the end, giving public comment, but when legislation was uh, attempted a couple of years ago to hold pediatricians accountable, for example, for lead screening, which is recommended by the CDC and, and the Bright Futures Schedule Periodicity, our doctors fought the legislation. It's, it's really concerning. So it, they're accountable, but they're not doing it. And so I just want to do a little bit more research before we add sure. it personally as a recommendation, just to see, you know, all Absolutely. the- Absolutely, I'll be happy to send you everything I have. Thank you, okay. Dawn, can I also just uh, ask a quick question? If I remember correctly, because uh, obviously we've been diving down into this particular issue, they're paid to do this, a part of their contract. So their incentive is already there. The fact that they are not needing that particular contract guideline is concerning. Yes, it's an accountability issue. And I, I can send to you the contract. It's a master agreement between DHSS and the MCOs and where the contract requires the MCOs to monitor the pediatricians who accept 
Medicaid and CHIP, but there is not um, an accountability measure. There are not required reporting uh, measures. So it's all there in the requirements, but it's, it's simply not happening. And it's funded. I think what we should do on that one, because I think there will be, is we should that, and it, that we should have some either online discussion or actually that would be, uh, you know, we would have this uh, discussion on an actual vote on that one at our next meeting. Um, since that, since everything else seems relatively straightforward and that, uh, you know, I don't know that it, it may not be, but it seems that thus far, um, that one may be one we definitely want to talk about. Um, uh, it's, yeah, I'm gonna. I will refrain from saying anything substantive about that one today. Um, I will have things to say about it, um, uh, but but I think that we want to. We will want to devote some uh, time to talk about that one after after um, Christina's had a chance to look into it. I'm pretty familiar with that issue, um, uh, but I did. But I think it's reasonable to get have folks to have some time to prepare to talk about it. Um, so I think I think it's great that it's been raised and I think we want to totally put it on the table. I think to some extent it also, and I see that um, Dr. Farley is also uh, on here, it may overlap with um, consumer issues as well to some extent. Uh, and it doesn't make sense for both subcommittees to address it. I think one, I mean, it, they could, but I think it makes more sense for one to tackle it. Um, uh, rather than both. Okay, the next issue we talked about already, that's the needs assessment. Um, don't think we need to discuss that one anymore unless people think we do. Um, that seems fairly straightforward. Um, uh, and then the last one is um, to think about eliminating DVI and redistributing its uh, mission amongst the other divisions or agencies better suited to the provision of such services. I am not an expert on um, uh, visual impairment, um, but I don't, I don't know that there was a lot of controversy over this one. Um, but I'm, I'm certainly being, I'm certainly prepared to tell, being told you're full of baloney, John, and this is a hot potato that we, uh, that, that there is a, you know, that it's a really controversial provision. And with that. I am done with going through the six. Thanks, John. Well, it sounds like at least um, we have at least maybe two additions to or sub bullets so far. Um, you know, one potentially the, the item that Don mentioned, the EPSDT, if I'm saying that right. And then yep. um, Cheryl Hikes uh, mentioning about, you know, uh, providing additional staffing or, or training for division of um, uh, healthcare quality. Uh, to be able to train, you know, home health care or drug support professionals, uh, especially, you know, in terms of COVID, for example, and PPE and testing and things like that. Um, was there any other... Really providing them resources, just in general. They need resources. They need, they need more people to be able to inspect. They just don't have enough. The, you know, the Division of Health Care Quality has been shortened in terms of staffing for inspections overall. Um, so, and it, I know it's hard for them to find staff, but particularly in this area as that, as that group has grown, as the home and community base has grown. Got it. Yeah, I, th I think that's completely reasonable and I don't think we'll have any trouble. Um, and it's not the same as, as payment rates, but it goes hand in hand with payment rates. It's not just home, it's just a, it's, it's right. home and community based resources for, because some of that is provided, as you mentioned, by, home, by caregivers and others. Yep, absolutely. And then um, to, to the point of the uh, visually impaired, um, and maybe I'm wrong on this, but for, didn't they do sunset not too long ago? Go through sunset? You're right, Cheryl, they did. And I, I think, I can't recall if the final report is out yet. I believe it might be, um, but we can check on that. So it might be mood. Yeah. Or at least we could look to that to see what what their findings were and whether or not there was anything left undone or, or, you know, for things they needed to work on or suggestions. Cause I, I thought they just did sunset not, not that long ago, but it was, um, time has sort of slipped away. Uh, so <laughs> longer than, maybe longer than you mean, I you mean the last year that we've all had that one? 
Yeah, one, one year that felt like 10. Were, were there any other, um, any other thoughts or additional recommendations that anybody has at this point or any concerns about the ones that we discussed? Well, I, I have a recommendation related to lead levels for Part C eligibility. We could put that in with EPSDT and um, I'd like to hear more from Amy Rowe who is going to give public comment. I don't know if that would, if putting that within EPSDT would capture um, that significant concern. Okay. Um, hey, John, can I ask a question? I know there is a, a lead, um, childhood lead uh, task, I don't know the exact name of it, task force that's meeting. Is, is this one of the issues that they're working on? I'd like to defer to Amy Rowe, who's here to give public comment. Okay. This is your area of expertise. Okay, gotcha. I, I just, I'd hate to get in front of something that's already in the works. It's just my... Well, my it's my understanding that, that it's, it wasn't meeting for a while. It wasn't meeting. It uh, led advocates, led free Delaware advocates had to move that work forward. And there was a belief that was inaccurate that lead poisoning had been eradicated from Delaware. And that is not the case. So, um, and part of the, the chat, the problem is that the eligibility for lead the eligibility for early intervention, which is part C birth to three, um, the national, um, I, have, I have the language, so I don't wanna misspeak. Um, the, the recommendation from the CDC is that to be a level of, I think it's five micrograms. That's again, I need Amy to provide me with that detailed information. But in Delaware, we have it at 10, we have a very high level of lead poisoning to be eligible for early intervention. So in 2012, the Centers for Disease Control lowered the eligibility number to five, but Delaware did not follow that national best practice recommendation. So it is a recommendation that we lower it because there were over a thousand children, I think in the past, um, from 2012, to 2016, over a thousand children who would have been eligible. And so uh, for early intervention services and lead poisoning is irreversible. Uh, so we must, we must find children who have been exposed to lead as early as possible. And the key, the critical time is two years old. And we are not complying in uh, Delaware with that lead screening at 24 months. So we have children who were exposed to lead for years and years and years and years, and it's not being detected. Okay, anything else? All right, uh, moving on down the agenda, I think we already discussed item five, the review of the new information, at least in terms of the uh, intermittent study of rate methodologies, and then the memo that DHS has provided on um, items that would be better suited for regulation versus code. Um, is there any additional new information that has come out since we last met that might affect our recommendations? Or, um, you know, the only thing I can think of is, as Cheryl mentioned, the um, uh, sunset review of the Division of um, vision, Visually Impaired. So we'll take a look at that. Anything else? Okay. Uh, in terms of next steps and action items, I think maybe the best uh, course of action is um, for us to take a look at the potential new items, uh, take a look at the, all the recommendations but also consider the um, items that were discussed today to be potentially added to our recommendations uh, between now and our next meeting, whenever that will be. Um, John, what are your thoughts? My first thought is I have to take myself off mute. My second thought is I agree. I think what we should do is we should, our next meeting should essentially have other than the you know, the pro forma stuff that we all have to do should have two components, finalizing the already essentially agreed upon recommendations, um, and then two, uh, having this uh, uh, discussion about the, uh, the newly proposed ones. And I think what I would, I think we should do is, is in between the meeting, gather information and at least have a, 
uh, a draft of something uh, to the uh, which we don't have to adopt, but so that we so that to try to make it one meeting rather than two, and sort of do the prep work so that we can have a potential recommendation that we can talk about and vote upon rather than talk about it and then have another meeting to finalize and vote upon it. I think we'd like to try and get away with one additional meeting instead of two, unless Christina, you think that's not realistic. No, well, I think one meeting is, is ideal. I agree. And then I think what we would do is we'd have a draft up and as we uh, adopt, you know, assuming we pick, we do, do something with it, we can make changes on the fly um, on a document um, as we as we're doing it, and then vote on it um, formal formally as a committee and uh, closer to the end of that meeting. Does that um, one way, you know, again, assuming there's assuming that we get some you know, figure out what we want to do about it, uh, and then and then potentially vote on it before the end of the meeting, um, so that we will walk out of that meeting having or having all of our recs finally in line in final form so that Alexa is happy. <laughs> Sounds good. And then in terms of timing, Alexa, did you say we should probably shoot to have our next meeting within the next two weeks? Um, if that is something that you were able to do, I'm looking at the week of the 15th, maybe um, I'm looking at the 19th. Um, just, you know, some subgroups were going with every three weeks, but with the, you know, kind of um, spot that we are at with finalizing recommendations. Um, I think two weeks would be okay, um, depending on availability. And we can always talk offline about availability as well. So either the 19th or the 26th, um, if we're only planning on having one, right? Because the, the task force meeting is not until April, is that right? The we big one. Set a date. Um, but we are waiting for the subgroups to finish up all of their work. So I feel okay. you need to meet on the 26th that that would be okay. I can always yield to Senator Poor or Taylor for additional comments. I, I think part, so what I think it depends upon um, is, uh, 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 you know, if we get 10 volumes of materials to study, then it's going to be a little longer. If we get 20 pages, it's going to be a little less. So I think maybe we can shoot for the 19th. Uh, at least initially, see how much materials we get. I think if we need an extra week to be able to 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 think about it, that's fine. If we don't, we don't. But I so maybe we'll just we'll leave that in flux, maybe for the next week to see what. And hopefully, uh, from our both from uh, our member of the public who's speaking, and if some of that information is is coming through dawn, if we can get that early to midweek next week, then we'll have a much uh, and this is purely just workload adjustment. We'll have a sense of what our workload is to address this, and that will uh, inform us about how much time we need um, to digest it so that we can have a meaningful meeting either on the 19th and the 26th. I do think we want to push really hard only to have one more um, meeting, even if it ends up being a two-hour meeting. I, I would rather have a longer single meeting and get it all done than try to schedule everybody for two meetings, um, if at all possible. Does that sound okay, Christina? Christina and I have not consulted about this in advance, so I'm just speaking off the top of my head, and I'm hoping that that makes sense to her. That's, that's fine with me. And hey, Cheryl, did you have your hand raised? Yeah, sure. Go ahead. Yes, I just wanted to let you know I sent uh, Christina to you and Alexa because I could find your emails quickly uh, where you can find the link for the information on visually impaired. Thank you. Great. Okay. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. So we'll, uh, okay. we'll play by either the 19th or 26th and get back to everybody on, um, on the date. The 19th would work. For me personally, it would work better for me. I have more avail. It's um, I have more availability that day. Okay. And I would just personally have to do it a little bit later, maybe like eleven thirty instead of ten. Um, That's better. Okay. And then if we and again, I think we should not plan on spending a longer time, but uh, but anticipate that it that we may well not get done. So I don't think if there's going to, because I suspect there will be some real discussion, I don't think we will get done in an hour. I think that is unrealistic. I think we want to plan on two, two and a half 
I, I know it's terrible, but I think we're going to, I think people will, particularly if we have to vote at the end, we're going to need a commitment from our voting members so that we have a quorum to be willing to stay till the end to do the votes. And Senator Poore? Yes, I just wanted to- Oh, Senator Paul, hello. <laughs> I'm here, I'm here. I just wanted to um, thank this committee for sticking with us and continuing. I know that this last year has not been easy. And in fairness to the DHSS department, um, even though the things that we're talking about were pre-COVID, we needed to allow them the ability to do what was best for our constituents and taking care of the people in Delaware. So we needed to give them that reprieve in being able to focus on COVID. Um, but we are at a point, uh, I really think a pivotal point that we needed to go back and revisit this and make sure that we are getting these recommendations um, put together so that a final report can be drafted. And as we go through that final report, um, really talk about the legislation that needs to be delivered to the Senate and the House. Um, and so, you know, I just, again, want to thank everybody for continuing to come back um, and also giving 100% effort because I hear it in every single one of these meetings. And I am extremely thankful. And I'm going to thank you for the people in Delaware. And also just in the simple, uh, simple, part of saying that, you know, this is to make the, the DHSS department stronger, better, more effective, more efficient for every single one of us. So thank you very much for all the time that you have spent and all your efforts that you have put forth in this committee. I am eternally grateful. Thank you, Senator Poor. Thank you, Senator Poor. Thank you. Appreciate Any it. Any comments from the committee before we open it up to public comments? All right, Alexa, are, are you able to run the public comment portion? Yes. So um, we will now open up the meeting for public comment. We did have one person um, pre-registered to speak, so I will allow them to talk first, um, Amy Rowe. And then after that, we will um, call on anyone else who has their hand raised to provide public comment. I have allowed Amy Rowe to talk. Um, so sometimes there's a lag time. Um, Amy, can you hear us? And um, can you try speaking and introducing yourself? Uh, is everyone able to hear me? Yes. Oh, perfect. Uh, my name is Amy Rowe. I am a lead poisoning prevention advocate. I have been doing this type of advocacy for about five or six years. I am the co-chair of one of the subcommittees of the Childhood Lead Poisoning Advisory Committee. I noted there was a question from the member of your committee about that, and I can answer any questions about what's been going on uh, at that level, but that, sub, uh, that committee has been meeting since, um, I believe, November or September of 2018, 2019. So recommendations for that uh, committee will be coming out uh, very shortly. They've adopted the recommendations for my subcommittee and are drafting their report. And in that uh, recommendation report that's coming out will be support of lowering the eligibility threshold for idea part C, which is one of the things that Ms. Alexander had mentioned that I just wanna speak about uh, um, initially. And then also I believe that she wanted me to talk about the issue with testing and the position of pediatricians on the Sean Matthews bill from two years ago. So I can answer questions on that too. Please feel free to interrupt me. Um, the issue with IDEA Part C and the eligibility is something that my colleague, Sarah Bucic and I have been advocating for for several years. We went to the Interagency Coordinating Council and made a presentation. I believe it was in uh, March of 2019 about this issue. We're not testing a lot of children for lead poisoning uh, in Delaware. This is something that Ms. Alexander had mentioned. Uh, we are testing fewer than half of the children that are required by law according to the Childhood Lead Poisoning Prevention Act. So this is an issue that needs to be addressed and I believe that it will be addressed. But of those children who are identified, approximately two thirds are not getting services through IDEA Part C because they don't meet the eligibility threshold of five. Um, right now, the IDEA Part C allows children to get services at 10 micrograms per deciliter 
uh, the objective would be to lower that to five so it matches CDC recommendations on the definition of lead poisoning. We know that children with lead levels as low as three are having problems in school. So it makes sense to bring it down. I will say uh, that the level of, uh, of eligibility was lowered in 2017 from 40 micrograms per deciliter to 10. So we have made progress on that, but we need to make more progress so that children who are identified to have elevated blood lead levels can get early education intervention, which has been proven medically to help prevent the need for special education. And children who receive early intervention are able to engage in kindergarten and first grade with their cohort with, a, with a, a normal, I don't want to use the word normal, but non-special education classes. So that's an important goal to reduce the number of children in special ed, to reduce the need for special ed. So idea part C, lowering that to five would really go far in achieving that goal. On the issue of testing, this has been um, an area of real concern uh, as Ms. Alexander mentioned, in 2019, there was legislation. In fact, in 2017, 2018, there was also legislation. So there have been two bills that did not make it through the General Assembly on the issue of two-year testing right now. Childhood Lead Poisoning Prevention Act requires testing of all children at age one, and then some kind of screening questionnaire for children at age two. There's no evidence that the screening questionnaire is actually being used because the Department of Public Health does not collect data on that. But the, um, the Bright Futures report suggests testing at age two. Age two is when children are most likely to be identified as having elevated blood lead levels because they're actually mobile in the homes and interacting with lead dust. And so that's a very important age to target for blood testing for children. It's just a finger stick. It doesn't have to be a venous blood draw, but we did get resistance on that bill from pediatricians. And the resistance was even, you know, it's very unfortunate to have to say this, but Dr. Rite, the director of, the, uh, of DHSS, even testified at the public hearing in the house on that bill against two-year testing saying that testing children for lead poisoning harms children. And I believe that's a direct quote, harms children. That's very alarming to me. There's, there's some kind of attitude uh, in Delaware that has allowed the lead poisoning situation to really get out of control. I think that that attitude has, 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 has come from the top with this harm children testimony. However, I will say, and this is very encouraging, that there is a subcommittee of the Childhood Lead Poisoning Advisory Committee that was tasked with addressing this issue of two-year testing. It includes pediatricians from Nemours, uh, a retired pediatrician from um, St. Francis or Wilmington Hospital, and others, and they are recommending now two-year testing. So they've gone through a process of evaluating the merits of two-year testing and the Childhood Lead Poisoning Advisory Committee's report to the General Assembly, which should be coming out uh, in a month or two, I would imagine, uh, will be recommending that and, and will hopefully have the support of the Medical Society of Delaware, which opposed two-year testing and hopefully have the support of the pediatricians now. So there may be uh, some changes in that regard just because there's been a opportunity to have the hard conversations about it. Uh, so I'm very encouraged about that. But if anyone has questions on any of those other things, I'm happy to answer those. Thank you, Amy. Any questions? Or any other public comments? If there are no questions, I can um, make Amy uh, an attendee and I can go to the next person for public comment. Thanks, Amy, I just want to ask that you send that information, send the information that you shared. You can send it to me and I'll be sure to forward it to the rest of the subcommittee members. Mm -hmm. Certainly will. Thank, Thank you. you. Grateful for your time. So now our next. Thank item. you, Amy. Just wanted to thank Amy for her testimony. I think it's 
really useful and important for us to hear from concerned members of the public about these important issues. And I, you know, I thank both her and Dawn, since I assume she knows Dawn, <laughs> the, um, uh, for arranging for you to be here today. Thank you. We have another person um, who has their hand raised to provide public comment, Dr. Ann Farley. So I'm going to now allow her to talk. Hi, Dr. Farley. Hi, Alexa, how are you? Uh, yeah. It's nice to see everyone on this committee, um, and I appreciate the opportunity. Our uh, committee uh, has completed its work and report, and um, it's nice to see the work and recommendations that you are. Kudos to you. I wanted to make a few recommendations because they were not in our report, and you were looking at best practices. And um, as I reviewed our report, hindsight, and we finalized it by committee, I wanted to raise these issues with you um, and uh, for this best practice committee to consider those uh, initiatives because they are examples of best practice across the country. In the presentations last year, we had interviews with all of DHSS leadership. We also did uh, surveys and we had 491 responses of which over 50% were line or DHSS employees, many of them line workers. And so even though it was not a stratified report, it uh, was statistically significant given the number of DHSS employees. One of the outstanding issues was transportation. Um, last year, round trip was promised to be implemented in 2020. Um, that's a system that gets individual clients transported to and from care. Other states are using it. Pennsylvania just got recognized it for national recognition for best practice for how far they have. Um, and we didn't, roll, we cited transportation as a problem. We didn't cite a solution. I was kind of looking at best practices to have more of this be more solution or because we did more of a gap analysis. I don't know where DHSS is in this, in that process. So I wanted you to consider the um, notion or recommendation for DHS as to implement round, round trip as they had uh, intended. The other area that we got into was really care coordination and the breakdown and fractures that occurred there. Um, many of the case managers and workers really highlighted this. And um, we were also told last year that there would be electronic care coordination platform. I forget the acronym they were calling it, but that would be implemented in 2020. And I have no idea where DHSS is in this impl implementation. But right now, care is really tracked inefficiently through uh, paper, telephone, faxes, and it makes quality of care coordination problematic. The third area that I wanted this group to consider was the issue of technology. Across the board in DHSS, there are technology components that are just not keeping up with the industry. And there needs to be follow-up as to where that is. For example, you know, they, legislation has been passed in the state requiring providers to have electronic medical record keeping. Yet at DPC, the Delaware Psychiatric Center, they're still using paper. Uh, they're still keeping files on paper. And so that, I think is something that needs to be um, to be looked at and a best practice that needs to be adopted by DHSS. When we really get into some of the other areas of, of care, and I know that you touched on um, visually impaired, we also did. We recommended, uh, we've recommended some organizational structural realignment for greater efficiency and efficacy in service delivery. But one of the big uh, best practices across the country since the 70s has been peer support services that would greatly help uh, in across the board. And um, the expansion of that within DHSS seems to have been stymied or it's not clear, it's just not grown to capacity as to where it could. Um, 
as well as looking at services to discrete populations and the most at risk, chronic homeless. I think uh, DSAM had a PATH program that, that was a promising, uh, that was also a best pra promising practice that there, that's also seems to be at a standstill. So there were a number of areas where we felt that the um, best practices, national best, because you were looking at having the national focus could take a look at those things. Um, our recommendations are more along the lines to address barriers, obstacles, and gaps, and um, the identification of those um, and the recommendation as, uh, you know, but we're out, a kind of recommendation how to strengthen that, the structure um, versus kind of pulling in from national best practices. So that's why I wanted to take an opportunity today to address this committee um, with follow up of things that were outstanding from us. So I wanna thank you for, my, for listening to me. Um, I was trying to be brief. Um, I, the last one was money on the table from Medicaid to federal grants, DHSS is leaving a lot of money on the table that could be had at a federal level and not maximizing that. And um, as other states do, when you begin to look at an analysis of uh, the federal re uh, return of federal dollars to our state based on, on those cri and criteria of programs that need it. And I think DHSS could be much more aggressive in that vein. May I ask a question of Dr. Farley? Yes, I'm not sure I can answer it. <laughs> um, are we able to get a copy of your recs? Yes. Um, yes. <laughs> yes. Of, for, um, yes. We um, ended that, up, is that is are you okay with that? And either in draft form or final form, so that we, we can at least sort of get some sense of the scope of what you have recommended, and um, either echo some of it or make sure we're not duplicating it, because um, obviously there is significant overlap between yes. um, between the, these two subcommittees. Well, as I see what you've done, you've really carved out a best practices. And I think you've gone into areas that we into a depth of areas. Like for instance, we didn't touch on regulations at all, really. And so, um, and you know, we started to touch on technology, um, but we didn't get really in depth there. But I will be happy to share our committee voted on 10 recommendations. We initially had 21. There were <laughs> Yeah. You're busy. We're a busy group, but we, you know, we had a lot of data. I mean, we had four, I, I, you know, COVID gave, I actually went through the 491 individual responses. That was a qualitative survey where people could write 25 words for each answer. They didn't because some of them were just identifying demographic criteria, but um, I'm happy to see that you are saying to do more needs assessment because we, um, because I do think that is a vital tool of information, as is real-time customer service satisfaction surveys. Uh, DHSS does not maintain any centralized waiting list, any centralized uh, consumer complaints. When I asked about the complaints, they weren't even, they, I received an email back saying to me what qualifies as a complaint is, and I, and, um, you know, I don't, that was very frustrating given that I ran an agency and I uh, have, and I think we all clearly know what a complaint is. And so uh, I was at some level of, of, of getting snowballed and accepting that and we just moved on and got our report. But I'm gonna share that with you along with our, um, our PowerPoint and, our, and, the, and the survey results of our interviews and of the results of the interview of the survey, the responses from the respondents. Great, thank you so much, Dr. Polly. You're welcome. Thank you for listening to me, I appreciate the time. Thank you, Dr. Farley. I see that Dawn has her hand up. Did you have a question for Dr. Farley? I wanna sure. thank Dr. Farley for providing that information. As someone who works in a public school system, so we intake three-year-olds, uh, there has been a challenge with the uh, receiving of information from Part C because much of that information is on paper. So, um, Dr. Farley, thank you for pointing out the challenges associated with 
documenting a lot of records on paper rather than through a centralized uh, database. It really, um, there are many challenges associated with that when families move, if you move from one county to another. So the ability to um, provide services with fidelity to children, because if they move, they sometimes slip through the cracks because the information is retained on paper. So thank you. Um, I also wanted to, uh, when you talked about uh, the no consumer complaints database, that has been uh, feedback that we've received from families when they, when they transition from birth to three, which is in DHSS to uh, local school districts, that they're, it's very clear within the districts how to make uh, complaints regarding special education services, but that is unclear in birth to three. So, you know, that's one um, program within DHSS, but certainly it's, it's very important for families to know, just a minute. you know, how they can um, register complaints and who will be following up with their concerns. So thank you for sharing that, Dr. Farley. Uh, may I talk? Um, thank you. And uh, one of our recommendations is re regarding the birth to three program and the fractured nature of, of many of DHSS programs. You know, I think it's safe to say um, DHSS was organized around the 20th century problems and not the 21st century family and emergent issues and the new, and new management systems. And so you have a very hefty bureaucratic structure that makes it very difficult to provide qu quality services in a timely, efficient, effective manner. And I hope that this task force and your recommendations look great. I wanna applaud your work and diligence. Um, and I do hope something comes of all what we've undertaken here. I believe Cheryl had her hand up and may have a question for Dr. I, Farley. Not so much for Anne, but thank you for that so much. And I appreciate that. I'd love to see the report, but are there any other subcommittees that we should be reviewing for the same point that Anne made for us in terms of looking for things that we should be uh, considering you know, from a compliance best practice perspective? Is there anybody else that we should at least review what they have come up with? Well, ironically, the only subcommittee that has done very minimal or no work at all would be our HR department, which I think would have had a direct correlation to all of these groups. If there are no other questions for Dr. Farley, I will uh, pull her back as an attendee. Thank you, Dr. Farley. Thank you. And if there are no other hands raised from the public, um, that will conclude the public comment period. All right, well, thanks uh, both to Dr. Farley and to Amy, appreciate your comments. Um, and, and thank you to all of the uh, committee members and guests uh, for, for attending today, really appreciate it. Um, so we will be back in touch uh, with regard to our next meeting and additionally um, reviewing the additions to the recommendations that have been proposed. John, any additional? Comments? No, do we need a formal motion to adjourn or do we just say we're done? <laughs> if we need, let's assume we need one and I will make one. And if someone this will second it. Second. <laughs> All right. Anybody all in favor? Good. Hi. Right. Great. Okay. So just in case we need one, we now have one. Is, uh, before we actually adjourn, is any, anything else anyone needs to add? No, oh, thank you. Great. I think that was, that was helpful. That was great. I'm grateful for this opportunity and to hear from all of you. Thank you. All right, bye-bye. Bye-bye. Uh,